Hey guys, it's God Bars here, the self-proclaimed hip-hop historian, and this is the 94th episode of my series where I grab a vinyl from my collection, talk about why I love it, what influence it had, and what its place is in the grand scheme of hip-hop. So I mention this album pretty much any time I'm talking about hip-hop supergroups, especially from the 90s. And as far as I'm concerned, Hieroglyphics is without a doubt top three when it comes to these bigger crews. I don't really count groups like Cypress Hill, Public Enemy, Outkast, or A Tribe Called Quest in that category. In my mind, you need a good six to eight members minimum, 3-6 Mafia, or Wu-Tang Clan. I talked a bit about Hyro and how important they were to my early hip-hop listening development in my video for Souls of Mischief 93 Till Infinity. So check that one out if you want a little more background on their impact on me personally, I'll put it down in the description. What I will say is that logo was on just about everything I owned in middle school, and the first album I ever bought with my own money was their second LP, Full Circle. I had only heard one song from it, but I had already been so inspired from what I experienced off the debut here that I just bit the bullet and bought all 16 tracks without blinking. Which doesn't seem like a big deal now, but back then that was pretty uncommon for me at least, especially for an album I hadn't even heard. I still love that album to this day, and know it front to back by heart, I just haven't gotten it on vinyl, due to it being pretty rare and expensive from at least what I can find. Also, while I may have a bit more of a connection to Full Circle on a personal nostalgia level, I'd have to give the nod to Third Eye Vision as the better project in their discography. Mainly because while the highs on their follow-up were as good as any classic Hyrule track, the lows dragged the experience down just slightly. Meanwhile, this debut really doesn't have a lackluster or half-hearted moment on it, and that's pretty impressive considering there's 22 tracks here that span over an hour and 10 minutes. Many rappers and artists in general struggle immensely to make 16 tracks interesting and captivating, and 22 is virtually unheard of. It takes a pretty talented act to be able to capitalize off that benefit of the doubt, where if it was an artist you've never heard of, you may be hesitant to sit through nearly two dozen tracks. But when it's a collective as consistent as Hyro, you know the 22 tracks all felt essential to them, it's never an attempt at padding to reach a certain runtime. There's a couple reasons for such a long track list, but the main one is virtually every member in the crew has a solo song named after them, where they get a minute or two to have the spotlight shown on them. I think it's a really cool and creative way to introduce new listeners to the various characters that make up hieroglyphics, and they also serve as a means to switch between group songs and ones with just one MC. The general concept and beliefs behind the Third Eye theme have become mainstays in modern hip-hop, with more underground acts of the last decade like Joey Badass or Flatbush Zombies building on and being very inspired by that idea of Third Eye Vision, referencing it constantly in their earlier work, along with their trademark 47 symbol that represents the heart and soul chakras, respectively. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, because I haven't even really broken down who made up this legendary outfit. Obviously, since I said how my 93 Till Infinity review had me sharing my love for Hyro, four of the MCs that made up the wider group were the various members of Souls of Mischief, Festo, Opio, A+, and Tajai. The collective was headed by Del the Funky Homo Sapien, and it also included Casual, Pep Love, DJ Tour, and Domino. They were based in Oakland, and their approach couldn't have been more different from other popular Bay Area artists at the time, like E-40, Spice One, Sibo, or even The Coop. Del alone had a massive amount of influence, both with his idiosyncratic flow and style, as well as having a fashion style that incorporated punk aspects a good 25 years before Cardi and the whole opium scene would ever think to do that. The thing with Del is he wasn't doing what Uzi did where I feel like he got bored of being a rap star because he didn't care about getting better as a rapper. When that happens, you end up stagnating, and I think it's why he went from getting constant excessive tattoos to the gem in his head, to now saying he wants to get every single tattoo on his body removed. It's all very dire and drastic decisions, because unlike Dell and other Hyrule members, I believe that Uzi felt the music was kind of secondary to his grand image. 
and being thought of as dark, edgy, and mysterious. It's why he loves Gigi Allen and Marilyn Manson so much. I seriously doubt it's due to their actual music as much as it is him wanting to have a similar provocative feel. But with Dell, you can tell through his output that he's a true music fan and him having a nose ring in the 90s at a time where virtually nobody else did, in hip hop at least comes off to me as him expressing the style he enjoyed. It isn't like he's just going, hey everybody, look at me, look at how different I am. Hyro was instead showing it was okay to be yourself and be different, and that MO was pretty essential to certain acts that came before them, like De La Soul. But there's a big difference both content-wise and sonically. While there's still themes of being yourself, it's a bit less patient than De La because they were more introducing this idea of it being okay to be weird or an outcast and still participate in the culture or even change it forever. With Third Eye Vision dropping nearly a decade later, you could tell that various members of Hyro weren't thrilled with certain acts and trends at the time. This is mostly emphasized on the track At The Helm, which might have been the first song I ever heard from the collective, at least it was either that one or You Never Knew. Either way, the former was the first song I'd ever heard that made me aware of this transgression in hip-hop, as it's a solo track where Dell is breaking down what being an MC means, and he doesn't hold back on the whack rappers that he felt were either biting directly from Hyro, or just didn't have skills on the mic. This is one of those songs I honestly listened to so many times when I was younger that at a certain point I kind of got sick of it, but luckily that was so long ago now it's kind of looped back around to where At The Helm kind of feels fresh again for me. It's without a doubt still relevant, and I think the hook Dell provides is one of the best representations when it comes to the spirit of the genre. He says, Life is a blast when you know what you're doing. Best to know what you're doing for your life get ruined. Life is a thrill when your skill is developed. If you ain't got a skill or trait, shut the hell up. One other line from this song I have to mention is, Rap ain't about busting caps and fucking bitches. It's about fluency with rhyme and ingenuity. All of this is new to me. I peep rhymes with scrutiny. Under a microscope, I walk a tight rope. Obviously, it kind of goes without saying that the guest list here for featured MCs and producers is pretty much non-existent, because similar to Wu-Tang's debut, there's more than enough members to have every verse and instrumental done completely in-house. This project is so tightly packed and consistent that I'm actually going to leave off the two biggest tracks from my honorable mentions or favorites just to free up some space. Those songs being You Never Knew and At The Helm, since I already talked about how much I love both anyway. The intro is actually insanely dope as well, it's probably one of my favorite instrumental openings to a 90s rap album, but I'm also going to pass that one up since there aren't any actual verses. My official honorable mentions would have to be All Things, Festo, Oakland Blackouts, Sea Delight, Off The Record, A Plus, No Nuts, One Life One Love, and Miles To The Sun. That leaves my three favorite tracks as Mike's of the Round Table, The Who, and After Dark. Thank you for watching my 94th video. Next time we're going to talk about one of the most creative and experimental concept albums to come not just from rap music, but modern music in general. So tune in for that one, and if you enjoyed, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know what your favorite tracks off this West Coast landmark are. Don't forget to have a great day, and I'll see you next time, okay? Alright.